So we're now joined by a writer and director, uh, Matthew Ward of Damned. Uh, Matthew, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks, Andre. Glad to be here. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. So we're super happy to have you on. Uh, so I wanted to talk first a little bit about uh, Damned as a piece and working and, and, and making that, and then talk to you a little bit about also yourself, uh, the craft, uh, being an artist, and, and the impact and connections that has the community. So. Um, the, the first thing I want to ask you is, what's the specific challenge of a short film versus um, filmmaking or short story? As a, a writer, I've worked a little bit doing with short stories and versus a novel. What do you think about that in terms of that challenge for you as a filmmaker? It's always the, the time that you have, I think, is the, the biggest challenge for filmmakers, especially when you know, that Dam started as a longer piece and I wanted to make the short film. So it's all about getting as much information as you can in that specific amount of time. And you want it to be impactful. Uh, you don't really have the time to, to have it kind of drag on out, the, the, the lull, the, the, the slow parts. You got to get what you need to get in there, uh, but also get, you know, get the pacing right. It's about the rhythm. You, you want it to be impactful, uh, suspenseful or intriguing but not, not rushed. Um, so, you know, it's like, it's like a Rubik's cube. You're trying to get all these aspects together to, to get in line with, you know, with it themselves. Yeah. And I think it's a challenge you definitely met with this piece. Um, one of the other things I, I always strikes me with, um, short films is that, um, I think they use the word impactful. I think I also need to care because there's a short amount of time to develop character. Um, and so if I don't care about the characters, the plot and all that might not matter. And um, I felt like the characters in Damned, even though we got to see them for such a small bit of it, um, they were really, like you said, it was a longer piece. I sort of felt like that, that I was just getting a glimpse of something. Um, and then as a viewer, um, I get to kind of fill in the blanks that are, aren't there on my own, um, and that, but they were intriguing. In terms of the, the plot, you know, I phrase that plot matters, uh, but the scene dominates. And an um, example would be like a, like a Quentin Tarantino where, uh, film where maybe the things are out of sequence and necessarily we don't have to follow the story as much as like the scenes are just so much, uh, so much intensity. Do you take that as a similar approach when you're doing a, a piece like this? Yeah, I, you know, I try, I, I have that in mind. And... I had a, a writing professor. Um, he, he, you know, he actually passed away when I finished his class. Um, he was a director too, and uh, he, he, you know, before you know, I made the big decision to go back to grad school, and it's not necessary for everybody. But I was stuck with a lot of things. I was getting stuck, and he had this approach where he would just, uh, he would just drill this simplification into your head. You're making it too complicated. You're, it simplifies, simplify it. And so for me, the plot and the scenes are all encompassing. They carry and they, they sustain one another. It's intertwined. And so for, for me, like, you know, with Tarantino, where his, and I had a really good friend who's like a Tarantino fan. Like that's his number one, you know, filmmaker. That that whole thing with, you know, some of the, his scenes, um, it's it's part of the plot. It's part of the whole thing. Um, it, it's uh, It's all encompassing. It's, it's, it's together, you know, and for me, you know, I, when I'm constructing, you know, something for a writer, it's, it's abstract. It's, you don't have it in front of you. You're pulling it out of your mind, you know, and you have different emotions with different scenes. And I have the overall feeling the plot. Now it's like, okay, how do I represent this in the scene? And I just kind of carry that with me. And I let, I've learned through that process with the writing professor and, and, and this trial and error to let the characters start talking through me, you know, um, and reduce that voice of that inner critic that I, that was blocking me um, for years. Uh, when you start to allow that, um, the plot and the scenes, they'll, they'll just start to come out and they'll start to kind of do 
it's like, you know, let me, let me do what I need to do. If you let that happen, it'll, it'll show itself. I totally agree where it's, they're, it's a balance. They sort of feed each other. It's not emphasis on one or the other. Who is this story about? Because there's a few characters. When you first, um, like, and that's what I was saying. I think that's part of what's fun about this piece is that I saw each one of these could have been a full movie about every, every uh, character that sort of shows up. So when you were first imagining the piece, though, who was the, the person, the voice that you heard for first? You know, the environment of, I filmed it in Germany, uh, in Berlin, and the environment uh, was its own character. And it was the abandoned buildings. There's a lot of abandoned buildings all throughout Europe, in, in Berlin, too. And it, the, the main character, although I was hearing Gretchen a lot, the main character, which I think is a great question you asked, is the whole scenario of, you know, what happens when uh, man, uh, humankind uh, starts uh, treating each other with disrespect, when they start taking advantage of one another. Um, you, you lose order and there's a chaos that ensues. There's an imbalance that's created. And so for me, uh, you know, with this virus that they're dealing with, which is analogous to what this, this pandemic we've been experiencing, is there's a disorder that's happened because of, for this main character is uh, just the example. For me, a deeper aspect is she's like the mother aspect when you're, you're mistreating this natural, this nature aspect um, of humankind, when you're uh, uh, degrading it, uh, when you're being selfish with it, uh, you're mistreating it. Uh, eventually, what you're doing will come back to haunt you. And that goes into every aspect of our aspect of our lives. What, you know, if you're doing something that's not in order with your um, uh, ethics, um, you know, negative aspects could come out of that. So for me, the big character was this injustice, this 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 chaos that is created out of this um, uh, this injustice that's that's being brought upon this special person who should be celebrated and who could be used wisely in the scientific community. To help, uh, but instead, there's a, a selfish aspect and a, a greedy aspect um, uh, that comes out in an abuse of nature. Cases caused by the virus, now known as GS1. Since the first cases were reported 60 miles outside the city about a month ago, the death tolls are climbing at a rapid rate as food supplies and emergency aid are becoming Who is it? more scarce. The ICDE has yet to confirm the source of the virus. Come in. I was just making me some coffee. Please give me a minute.
I need you to explain more to me about her. Sorry, I do no longer research. I've been ordered to collect information from all the participants of the project. So, you were the head geneticist? Now I'm here to document your recollection of what went on at the facility. Have we plateaued with our genetics? Or are there more possibilities for advancements in human evolution? That was the basis of the project. Her name was Gretchen. She was one of the many that we studied. And the last. Months of research and only her genome and DNA samples passed all the preliminary tests. Excited, I reported my findings to the board. So they wanted to go further. We first began implanting her foods with simple bacteria. Then we moved on to more radical ones. E. coli, Salmonella, H1N1. Anything could destroy the immune system. Her. She was unaware of how phenomenal her biology was. Something only nature could perfect. I was convinced she was the future of our evolution. The next phase. She was exceptional. They wanted to control her. Weeks turned into months. Her isolation became more severe. Answers became shorter. But she wasn't stupid. She started to understand what was happening. That's when you resigned from the program? Unfortunately not. Companies began showing heavy interest. Who oh, I was responsible for converting her genome into a vaccine. She is one. It imitates the cells, deceives the immune system, then it attacks, spreading with might. Always changing, advancing. Like it knows what its purpose is. Is there a possibility for an antivirus? I do. You want to know about an antivirus? I thought you want to record my role in the genome project. Sorry, Mr. Gestalten. I must continue. Now. Sit down! Where is she? You're the headhunter. They sent you to retrieve their lost properties. She escaped her room and a fully guarded level 7. That was her level. So, Doctor, it highly appears as if someone from within the program assisted her with the escape.
Stop it! Faust! It's a deal with the devil for more knowledge! He gets everyone around him, including himself! Too many Fausts are in the world! I will find her. This piece you, you wrote and then directed, so I think people often from movies maybe have sort of a uh, stereotypical view of like what a director does on a, a movie set, a bigger set, and even on an indie film set. So what does, what was your role as a director? What do you see uh, the role of a director in a uh, production like this? I had a lot of intense experiences on this production and, you know, being in grad school, this was the most this was the best course in grad school I could have ever, you know, experienced. It was like being shot around a Formula, you know, one racing car at like 400 miles an hour. The learning curve was so intense. Um, I was dealing with crew from different countries, Greece, Germany, uh, America, um, you know, you know, you name it. And a director on an independent production you know, can, can differ in a lot of aspects from like being on a, you know, a, a union studio project or even a mid-level budget film, like, you know, I don't know, five, $10 million or something. Uh, you're you're, you're going to be doing a lot of different things. You know, you could be, depending on your crew or where you, you could be pulling cable and calling action uh, or being uh, the psychologist to your actors and crew like I was. I was all of the above. And you'll most likely experience that. You're probably going to be the financier of your own film. You know, you name it, <laughs> you're probably <laughs> going to experience as a um, uh, independent director. But what I did want to point out, what I've learned from this experience is that, you know, director gets a lot of flag. You know, there's just kind of, uh, I don't know, what does the director actually do? What I learned and, and what I wish there's more of in, you know, different film schools or, or younger filmmakers or, you know, beginning filmmakers that, all the stuff that's happening with all the technology and, and things like that, the, my, the main thing the director is responsible for, whether you write the project or not, is you're responsible for the tone and mood of the film. 
and your and that is uh, your responsibility and also your dialogue with your your actors. Nobody else is going to be talking to the actors unless you give them permission to talk to the actors. It's your responsibility to express your ideas, the, uh, communicate uh, the scenes, uh, the motivations, the intentions with your actors and maintain that rhythm and mood, that tone all throughout the production and even into post-production. It's an invisible aspect that nobody is paying attention to because everybody's doing all different things, you know, parking the truck, putting up the lights, whatever, uh, issues with the location. Uh, out of all that, it's your responsibility to keep that in your heart and your mind and know that I'm responsible for this invisible aspect that nobody can see, uh, only I can. And I have to, to make sure that we're, um, you know, getting this ship out to sea and, and back into dock, um, you know, in the best way possible. With that comes the responsibility is what I'm hearing too for you. You like, you, you know, this is why you have that role as a director. Um, and so you, there are some unique things that the director is responsible for, um, but you're also responsible for everything else. And, and um, having great people to work with makes that probably, uh, a great experience too, even though all that responsibility is there. It doesn't matter if you're 20, you're doing your first short, first short, because you'll deal with a lot of experiences where you may have, you know, a key crew members challenge you on stuff like that. And I've had, I had that happen to me on the short film where I was challenged by a certain crew member and I had to, you know, uh, I had to, I simply put, I had to shut it down. I had not the production, but I had to shut that, that, uh, that kind of uh, static, that uh, disruption down uh, in order to maintain, you know, why we're all here. You know, hopefully, uh, you know, the director won't have to experience that, but there may be a situation where you might in different aspects. Throughout all that, you, you, you still need to focus on, you know, why, why you created this project, why everyone's here, uh, because at the end of the end of the day, you're responsible for that. And if it's good, everybody's going to celebrate and say, "Yeah, I was part of that." And if it's bad, people, you know, will run away from as far as that. You know, <laughs> that that my my thing. You know, so you might as well, and you should, you know, be responsible for it. And and any, any anybody's giving you an issue, you say, "You know what? We're here to do a job. We're here to you know do this work. Everybody's here. This is we're fortunate to be here. And you know, let's let's do the best project we can. Let's let's all work together on this. You know." that there's a lot of different aspects to film. And I think most, most of the time people, when they, you know, you, you talk about, you watch a film, people don't say, I listen to the film because the, there's the, like the dominant aspect of it. But even like the way that music is composed of multiple different instruments and, and has lots of different layers. Um, how, how do you feel the role of sound plays? I think sound definitely in the, the films that I've seen you make um, has been one of the striking things to me. And I think it's sometimes the thing that, gets ignored. Uh, what is your process and, and how do you go about sound in a film? I'm so glad you asked that because uh, Itamar was the sound guy uh, talking about international production. He was uh, from Israel and he, he was helping us out in Germany. I specifically talked to him about the sound and I said, I, I wanted to get all the sound. He was, I was fortunate because he was really into exper experimental uh, sound recording, amb ambiance, and he would distort sounds and he would hit a piece of metal and just record. I said, I, I want just get what you can. I think we've talked about this already. And so for me, and I've learned through watching other films and TV series that it's still not paid attention enough. I think some of the better films, the, the greater film projects, projects I've seen have included it. And I think that's what enhanced them. And this is the thing about the art, you're dealing with several different art forms in one. And for me, what is not being told can be expressed through sound. E and for me, even the silence is the sound itself. You can get a lot of emotion out of silence um, and not just, you know, having, you know, something kind of reverberate. So sound is, it's another character in the film. And it's, it's, for me, it's important to know, okay, when is it needed? When is it not needed? Um, and I think you do a great job. You talked a little bit about, um the importance of having pace and being in a rhythm um, and, and the project having a flow. Um, I, another thing that struck me with the film was uh, sort of the attention to move, like camera movement within the film. You know, there's not, um, you know, there's, like you said, it seemed like real intention with static shots, but also 
a lot of different shots, especially in the, uh, the scene where they sit down in the, at the kitchen table. Um, um, talk to me a little bit about how you approach that, the role of, you know, how do you work with a DP or do you yourself design um, beyond just this is going to be two people at a table and we're going to have some cameras here? How do you then approach what you do for movement? Yeah, well, I talk about, I, I, I try to plan out, well, I plan it out where, where the, I grab photos or images or, or, or boards, you know, illustrations or both. And I talk about it with the, the DP or who, who, whoever is going to be my DP. And I said, this is the shot I want. Like, for example, the, with the scenes with the kind of the corporate headhunter, ICDE and the, the gen geneticist, you know, I wanted to frame them a specific way to create that tension to, to, to create. It's not so, so much symmetrical at, at times. And, and there, there's, there's a reason for that. And uh, for me, I, I love camera movement, um, specific camera movement. Again, it doesn't need to be overdone, but, you know, I've been watching a TV series and um, where they specifically frame the actors a certain way. And I enjoy it. I don't, I, you know, I don't see it a lot in for some, for some reason, American TV, but in general, um, I, I see it just a lot of kind of three quarter shots, you know, maybe head on, um, side at an angle, back and forth, back and forth. But, you know, just every, everything on, on set can be used to enhance um, or express uh, the story and emotion. Um, and I just try to utilize that when I can, uh, wherever I can, where it's, uh, you know, I feel like it's appropriate and effective. Um, so at, at framing an actor a specific way um, is, it's not just the actor talking, it's, the, that is the story and the emotion being expressed, how the actors film in, in, in partnership with what the actor is saying. Yeah, it sounds, um, what, part I hear that I like, really like about that is that, um, and comes through, I think, why um, your films are able to achieve that impactfulness is that you are looking for, everything is an opportunity to help tell the story. Like, um, you know, every, every opportunity, whether it be the sound, the framing, what you can use those things to tell things about the character. Because as we talked in the beginning, you have such a, a compact amount of time to get things across. And, and so how do you say things in, in other ways than dialogue? Um, and I think that, yeah. I just want to say as an independent filmmaker, you know, and e even if you're making a, a, a film for like, I don't know, $300 or something, you're still an independent filmmaker. You don't have a studio help or a heavy financier helping you, but um, you, you, you've got to use what you can. And I, I, some of the best films I've seen is like, even, even with some of the bigger talent, um, I say, why do I like this film so much? And it's, it's, I don't want to say minimalist in a bad way, but it's so simplified. Like it seems like they were just using what they needed to. Um, like for example, I heard Steven Soderbergh say, well, one of his films or his film projects, he just wanted to use three lenses and that's it. And I thought that was a great idea. Um, whether he only used it on that film or some other films, I thought, well, and he's, he's used to doing independent films. That's how he you know, really, really started. He still prefers that kind of style when he can. But it can be constricting and sometimes frustrating, like, geez, I wish I had this extra thing. But there's a blessing in disguise when you get that and you go, OK, let's see how well we can do this with with these limitations that we have. And that's a huge blessing that you, you can uh, create when you get that team together and they go, OK, let's do this. Um, yeah. You can really turn things around. Yeah. You mentioned a little bit um, with particularly what's going on in, in uh, quote unquote real life now uh, with the pandemic and this piece sort of deals with uh, something serious, a virus that's a potential biological weapon and, and um, the impact that it would have. Um, so what, it, what was it like when looking back at a project like this that you made uh, specifically about the content, but also when you go back and look at projects like that, you, this that you've done. I think, you know, it was su surprising for me, but, you know, I, so for some reason I felt like it was important to tell the story because it was still somewhat realistic. You know, it, for me, it wasn't far off. Like, it wasn't like a sci-fi. It was like, you know, there's always a little bit of truth in, in fiction, you know? <laughs> so <Right. laughs> I think it that way. And 
you know, uh, you know, I, I, I definitely think that me personally, uh, I think writing and, and art is a spiritual process for me. And I definitely think a lot of artists tap into the, you know, the subconscious, collective conscious of, of, you know, their community and society in certain aspects. I had, a, I had a difficult time, you know, with filming in a different country. It was a big test for me. It was a big challenge. So um, the only thing I think about, honestly, is like, you know, okay, you know, we, we could have we could have made this, uh, you know, this this aspect of the that department tighter. Uh, you know, next film, I'll definitely go through, you know, this process to, uh, you know, get more people and things like that. Um, you know, I did wish we were able to film more exteriors, but honestly, you know, looking at it, I was pleased with how it still came together. Um, you know, looking at it again recently, I was, uh, you know, when, you know, the opening shot, we were able to film at, the, you know, the Dutch embassy in Berlin, you know, I think that was a huge feat. Um, you know, we, that was actually a, a big thunderstorm. That was the first night of shooting. It was like raining <laughs> and thunder. And so, you know, a lot of things are happening. You know, we filmed at a, a, a veterinary, uh, veterinarian college, um, that ending scene where she's running away and, uh, across from the university, there was a lab and, the alarm went off because there was a um, a bacteria leak in the uh, in the lab, and so all the all the white coats, the scientists came out, and my my DP was like, he was so shocked. He was like, "Oh my gosh, this is like, is this really happening right now?" <laughs> um, so we had a lot of great things like that. Well, it's not great, but you know, a lot of like interesting things happen. Uh, but I try not to go, you know, uh, you know, really harp on those things because a lot of those things happen for specific reasons and you know, it, in, in a way it helped to get the film to where it is now. They all play their parts, uh, whether, you know, we understand them or not. So to be able to, you know, me for this film, to be able to film in another country with a, you know, international crew and all the challenges we faced, uh, you know, weather locations, you know, you know, just the, the small crew, you know, I, we still have a film, um, that, uh, was completed and released and you know i'm proud of that and i take anything challenges obstacles uh i've experienced and victories and uh, as learning lessons and uh just try to get exponentially better uh on the next project uh, when you're writing something it's very easy to just decide to take that out or like invent something that you didn't have before maybe you get this idea and you're like you know what it would be much better if there was a grandma and or whatever you know and but when you make a film, once you've, once you've filmed, that's a new challenge, right? Because you're, we talk about limitation. You have what you captured through production. Um, uh, I noticed on the, um, another film that I saw that was on Vimeo, the uh, Cubiculum. Yeah, yeah, Cubiculum, yeah. Yeah, um, th that one you were able to edit. You, you wrote, you shot, you edited the whole thing. Um, so you've done some editing too. When you get in and as a director or an editor and you have what you have, how do you approach that? Where, you know, how is that different? How do you see that different from that initial creative process of I can just pull from anywhere to now I have what I, I got to make something out of this. Editing is, it was, a, um, I mean, even, I think the whole process I'm editing you're editing and you're writing, you're editing on, on, on set. Uh, and then you're editing in the, you know, post-production phase. Um, it was, it was, it was a good firsthand experience, um, about what I, what I was filming, um, what shot I need to get, what shots I don't need to get on set. Uh, it's for, for me personally, sometimes there's actually a lot of times there's a emphasis on just getting everything. And for me, I learned personally, I don't want to be a director where I'm just getting a, a whole master start to finish just because for safety. I know what I want and, I, and I'm going to get it. There's safety shots I get, but then I realized, you know what, I didn't need to get this. I felt like I needed to get it just for safety, but I know what I wanted. I know what I wanted and I just wanted to get this and that's it. And, you know, I, you got you to gotta trust yourself. Um, but the whole editing process for me, for, you know, cubiculum was that I learned that at this point, I wanted to have oversight. I just wanted to sit back and just look at everything and just have that other person edit for me. So I can just kind of be a little bit more, uh, 
removed, not in a distant way, but just to have that kind of that that master view of everything and see it kind of come together. I think at that point, I just want a breather to just take a step back and then allow, you know, the scenes and stuff to come together through, you know, another person. Yeah. And that's um, in terms of with that in filmmaking. So you're I think that's a an inter really interesting point, because it, as a director and, and you've written it, so you're really you're you're really close to this piece. Sometimes it can be hard to take a step back and then say, what does this actually look like? Uh, yeah. So that's a and, great point. And that's what I wanted to mention was that um, I, it's it's a point. It's an important point for me and maybe other filmmakers to take take that step back because you're so from start to finish. And then when you get finally finished with the production, you just need a breather. And I think for me, it's important. I learned through editing myself that this is a stage where I, I like to just be with the editor. And, and honestly, you've been close to it so much that sometimes you're not seeing certain things. Um, you're, you're harping on something too much. And th sometimes that, that good editor will say, I think this is okay. I think we can move on, you know, <laughs> or, or, or or you may be frantic because like, oh, how, is the, how are these shots gonna work together? And they come in with a, a great idea. I say, look, I, I think we can just add this. That's all it needs. And, and that's, that's, that's you know, I think for me personally, I've heard a lot of some other filmmakers talk. That's like a sacred experience for the uh, director because they're not around the crew. Anymore. They're not around all of this stuff. They're not, they don't know how to deal with locations. They're just in that production suite or the editor's, you know, room in the house and it's just, them just you know focusing on on the the story now so i'd like to take a step back and actually focus on you now for a second um a lot of times I interview artists um i worked in, in television production for a while it was always interesting to me if you talk to a TV meteorologist, they knew that they wanted to be a TV meteorologist when they were like two years old. Every one of them, uh, no doubt. Some people know they want to be like a firefighter as like, soon as they were born. Um, other people, I think, I hear from them, you know, their, their, their parents were uh, involved in the arts. Uh, they had some or someone else in their family or they had a group where they were really surrounded by that. And that's what influenced them. So Matthew, when you when you were first, what first got you into thinking filmmaking was going to be something for you? Uh, it wasn't until I was in college, actually. Um, I was like movies. I liked going to movies. I liked, you know, I was in that world when the movie was happening. I wanted to, you know, emulate the characters. And in college, I actually majored in philosophy, uh, but I was also going that that actor route. I was taking, you know, theater classes and, and whatnot, and. It was an interesting thing. I had a really good friend, one of my best friends. Uh, he 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 said to me, uh, "Oh, he's he's taking acting, but he's really a director." And <laughs> I was kind of, I was at first, I was a little insulted. I was like, "All this work I've been putting in, into just you know plays and and and." But we had a good history of, of he and I and another friend watching films, uh, you know, Criterion Collection and all that, the classics, and just talking about films and uh, ideas and it bother me in a way where I've learned where something bothered me bothers me like that where it just kind of resonates there's some kind of truth to it <laughs> and <laughs> you just can't you you just can't shake it you're like gosh why does that bother me so much and uh, you know he was right you know he he helped me see something that uh I, you know I didn't realize yet and you know going throughout university um I eventually just kind of you know uh did a uh I got a minor in film uh beside philosophy and you know, it was at that point where I was like, okay, I, you know, I definitely want to go the director route. And, you know, you know, I did a lot of jobs and, you know, did some short films here and there, worked on a lot of sets and for free and all that stuff. And then it wasn't until a few years later, I, you know, went back into grad school and, and started to really focus on it. But, um, I, yeah, I, you know, didn't have a, you know, I always hear these stories. I didn't have a, a camera at eight years old and wasn't filming or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, yeah, my my father's probation officer. They both retired. They were he was a probation officer, and my mother was a secretary at a community college. So uh, he he did a uh, you know major in music, um, but he you know went into you know probation work. So um, there was that creative aspect. My mom my mom loves reading. She reads you know she's I think she 
uh, has a good book in her, um, you know, uh, when she's ready to kind of finalize and release it. But um, I, I, you know, I was just kind of resonated with, you know, writing and telling stories. That, that's, that's all I had when I was a kid. I love just the extracurricular activity or the special project that, you know, you know, sixth grade, you know, write a story. And I'm, I got really into that. Yeah. You, you point out like um, something I, you know, I taught adult education for 10 years and, um, you know, students would always sort of push back with some of the curriculum, you know, I taught math and when am I ever going to use this? And part of what I think is hard is um, I would always say, well, tell me exactly what you're going to be doing when you're 30 years old, because, you know, uh, there's a lot of nonlinear paths to places. And I think uh, that's an interesting aspect because I, I think a lot of creative uh, kids in, in school, uh, elementary, teenagers in high school, they get a little confused because uh, we're in a world where there's a lot of STEM, like science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And, you know, you, you'll be in a geometry class and you'll just be over it already because you just want to go to the English class or you want to go to your theater class or music class or, you know, illustration. And, you know, um, it can be hard because a lot of those programs may be cut or you know, you only get to, you know a few hours you know, a week to do that and uh, you know it's it's hard to find support um, so I think it's good to have you know these programs like you're doing Andre and they're to, to really nurture that and preserve that and uh, you know share with other people that uh, they're they're not alone and that um, um, you know like you say the the, the, the nonlinear paths uh, you don't have to have it all figured out. Um, but just, you know, find your community, find, find your tribe. Yeah, that's a, um, a great transition to the next question I was going to ask you is that, you know, we're a community access station. Um, and some of the things you're just talking about, we did some like youth concerts. And one of the performers that uh, came in for an interview was saying that, that it was really important for her, for younger people in a community to see that even in a small rural town in Maine, that you can make art and you can be an artist. Um, how do you feel um, that art, being an artist, like the, I wouldn't, I don't know, responsible might be a heavy word for that, but um, just in terms of how that can build community, both in like a physical community, but also outside that. Well, I think, I think responsibility is, is a great word. It's heavy, but it's also, I think that for me, I take that uh, every time I'm writing and I've, I've had a lot of critiques on just films I've watched and I've, you know, I, I, I've seen it change in some good and a lot of bad ways, but you know, uh, there's always hope. Um, but I, I try to take responsibility in my work as writing. What, what message am, am I putting out here? Um, I think there should be more accountability of, you know, am I just making something to please somebody else or just attract money and financing to, to get the next job? Or um, uh, does it have meaning? Can it, can it help someone out? is it expressing an emotion that someone that uh, that someone is feeling right now that they can that can assist them because I do me personally I think ultimately think stories can help uh, they, they they have healing powers um, I've, I've been in in the dumps and I've seen a movie or a TV series where I almost feel like the character is talking to me they, they've experiencing almost exactly what I'm experiencing and yes it's it's a form of fiction but like for me there's always some some sort of truth that that that's coming from somebody who wrote it that that's coming from somebody who's experienced this. That means I'm not alone. That means if they can get through it, then I can. You know, you, you can't be from any place too small. Um, like I'm from Los Angeles. I, I, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. And I know a lot of people come to LA. Um, but me, you know, I've been craving more of just going to the woods and, and actually rural towns in, in the woods. And um, for me, it's, it's, it can also even be more powerful when you're in a, in a, in a let's say, quote unquote, small town. And I, I get excited when I see people from, you know, a place that's not Los Angeles. Like, you know, it could be, uh, you know, Portland, Maine or, or, or uh, you know, a small town in Idaho. And they're, and they're making something without all this, like, oh, I need an agent. I need this and I need that. And they're just coming together and they're just making a project. And for me, that's where the magic happens. I was talking to somebody, there, there seems like such polarization with lots of things now that people can't really hear each other when, they, you know, everybody's walking in with some talking points already. Um, and I think art can come at people when you, like you said, you see a film and you feel like it's talking to you or that feeling that you were talking about where it kind of irks you and you know there's some truth to that. Um, art can play a role, I think, where people can 
can see something different and not have expected to see that. How do you, how do you see that as art, uh, having that ability? I mean, I, I don't think it can, it does. It, it does it in, in various ways. You know, it, it's, it's about um, what it's resonating with. It, it, it's, 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 it's relation to the creation and, and the viewer and the, and the receiver. Um, so, you know, it could be an orchestra, it could be uh, a poet or a, a stage player or a film. Um, and it's as long as the art is coming from a place of truth, and that's the hard part because a lot of times we have that inner critic that is 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 is, is coming in, and you, the insecurity happens. Uh, you know, you talk about some people, a lot of people now with talking points, and you start hearing these other other voices in your head, like, oh, people don't like this; they'll think this is just um, I'm preaching, I'm I'm being, um, uh, you know, I'm on my high horse. Uh, but but you know. I, I heard a good point with Francis Ford Coppola a long time ago where he, oh, pretentious. He said, you know, a lot of times people are afraid to be pretentious. You know, they uh, they feel like they're on their platform. But he said, you know, um, it was it's something analogous. This this is his platform. I think you need to be a little pretentious. I think I think you need to say what it is you're feeling. And with my films, um, I, I I I'm into a social justice uh, message in there. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to hit anybody over the head, but for me personally, I feel like me, there's not a lot of films like that anymore where, you know, we're, we're being entertained and that, that has its place uh, because art can be entertaining as well. But some, you know, a lot of times I'm just missing like, you know, I just want some real issues here. Um, like, for example, I'm really into the TV show Sex Education and it's entertaining, but they actually are talking about real issues. And we're seeing those, those, those discussions um, happening right now in our schools, where does that fit? Um, I think we've had a long gap where, you know, things haven't been talked about. And so art is, a, is an expression, is a, it's a form of communication where uh, it can often evade what's politically correct and what's, um, what has been deemed, you know, certifiable. And you can kind of bypass that, you know, just to simplify, I think art doesn't have too many borders. It, it, it's free form. It, it, it can it can be free to uh, evade those status quos and reach that person directly. The smaller films, uh, because they're they're shorter, like you mm -hmm. said, that impact can come and hit harder sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think your work has done that. Um, do you uh, have other projects that you're working on now, Matthew? Uh, yeah, it's a project I've been working on for, you know, uh, a bit. Um, you know, we've had some stagnation with the uh, pandemic last year, but honestly, I've talked with a few filmmaker friends that it didn't, last year didn't bother me too much because we, we both felt like um, <laughs> we, we've all had our projects put on hold so many times. Now, now everybody can experience putting their projects on hold, <laughs> you know? We're, we're, we're not alone anymore. So, <laughs> yeah, I have a feature um, I've been working on uh, that's that's kind of my spearhead project right now and in, 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 in kind of uh, the writing on a TV series. But uh, I, I'm really looking to to get this feature off the ground. If you have, this is like the, the big matzo ball question. So mm. if there's a young person out there, they're considering, mm. uh, you know, they're on some path right now, mm. but they're in their mm. heart. They know, you know, I found myself as a college student. Uh, I went to a business school because sort of what I was talking mm. about. You know. Yeah. What are you going to get a job as a philosopher? But, um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be able to have an opportunity to say, you know what, I, I'm spending most of my time when I have time writing scripts and, you know, mm. horrible stand up comedy jokes. And, you yeah. know, that's what I find myself doing when I have the opportunity to do things. So what do you say to somebody that's like thinking about it and, and you know, what do they need to make that move? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Uh, this is coming from somebody who made a lot of those decisions, life changes. And I had criticism from, sometimes you'll get the harshest criticism from your family, from, from the closest ones to you. But uh, this, tomorrow's not guaranteed. We, we like to believe that we're going to be here tomorrow. Most chances you are, but it's not guaranteed. You'll see a lot of people who are not doing what they want to do, what they truly want to do. 
I think it's an important time right now. It, it's always been, but I think now hopefully we're wiser, but I encourage people to follow their instincts, follow that gut feeling, follow what brings them joy. If you really feel like you're going to be at a job for the next 30 years or even 10 years and you're going to be happy with it, and then do it. But if you really feel like you're going into whatever side a project that you like, whether it's creating a, a small business or making soaps or oils or writing or making or being a stand up comedian, keep finding ways to invest more time and, 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 and practice into that. That mean, doesn't mean you have to quit your, your, your day job immediately. Uh, but eventually figure out a way where you can be true to yourself and follow what gives you joy. Um, because it, you know, at the end of the day, you're responsible for your life. And if you're, if you want to say, oh, my parents wanted me to be a lawyer and they're not going to take the blame when you're unhappy 10 years down the road, they're, they're, they're just going to completely <laughs> you, you, resolve themselves in that. So I think it's an important time when, uh, you know, especially when you can make your own decisions to start really thinking about and reflecting on what makes you happy. I, that's most important. Take the time to really get away from everything, the phone or wherever, go to a park or wherever is your quiet space and think about what really makes me happy and then find ways to do that. It's going to be difficult because the way, you know, you know, we encourage things over others. But if you're really serious about it, stick to it the trials and errors, the, the failures and, and, and victories, they're all talent that you're, you're learning and, and wisdom that you're gaining to, to be more prominent and impactful. You mentioned somebody um, talking about simplicity earlier in mm -hmm. our, our interview, mm -hmm. uh, a, a mm -hmm. professor you had. Um, yes, 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 yes. How, how, much, um, how much of an impact do you, when you look back and think about people that were sort of mentors to you or people mm -hmm. along the way, how important is that mm -hmm. um, when you're saying you, so you make that leap and you decide this is something that I'm going to do, how important mm -hmm. are those people in, in, in that process? Uh, very important. Uh, sometimes you don't, you don't know how imp impactful they're going to be. You, you know, it's it all as just a small kind of meeting or experience. But, you know, you know that professor, uh, his name is Michael Gottlieb. Um, he, he made, did some films in the late 80s, early 90s. But his, his, his advice for me for writing, and I, I could see that he knew what I was going through. With just like, I was just constantly writing, rewriting everything. And I couldn't get past like a certain page because I was always doing that writing, rewriting, writing, rewriting. And he just kind of cut through that. And he said, save the notes and keep going. <laughs> just keep going until you finish. If it's going to be a 90 page script, keep going until there's 90 pages. Write your notes and keep going. Even if you realize the page before you had writing errors or you, you, you put a period where it should have been a comma, just keep going. And that little advice was just really kind of all of what I needed to get me to, 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 to make me, to, to propel me into, you know, what I knew I could accomplish, but had troubles doing. And, and that also came in other ways too. Uh, his was more prominent, but a lot of times it's, it's people I meet on trees or friends. They still say small things. And I, you know, I take, you know, uh, sometimes I think maybe I'm taking too much weight to the words, but everybody has a message for you. Uh, whatever you're going through, I think if you just pay attention a little bit more, and think about kind of what you're experiencing, what the issue is. People will have messages for you. Um, it could be the professor, it could be the guy on the street, the, the woman at the bus, um, your uncle who, who texts you randomly, you know. So um, I, I, I like to think, uh, you know, including myself, uh, you know, I'll, when I sit down and think, I'll come up with some of the answers too, but it could be one person or it could be a, a you know, a, a number of people at the right time um, that can, can be, you know, uh, they can be your teachers uh, if you really learn to just kind of pay attention to it. Matthew, you've been great to talk to. Um, this is a joy for me uh, to get to talk to other creative people, other artists that are, are busy making art and uh, willing to talk a little bit about their process and how they make it, um, and how it affects them and community. Um, so I really want to uh, thank you for your time and I uh, really enjoyed talking to you. I hope that um, when 
the project, the next project gets moving, if you would come back and talk to us again about that. Oh, Andre, most definitely will. Um, uh, that's if you can fit me into your, your schedule. I, I know the program is going to grow, you know, bigger and bigger. So, you know, <laughs> hopefully I can get to your schedule for the next interview. So, <laughs> but, but I appreciate it. I honestly, I, I think this is great. I, 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 anytime when, you know, I, I'm going through, you know, the channels, I, I if there's, there's few and far between, but, uh, you know, channels and networks that really encourage uh, arts, arts in the community uh, is, uh, you know, diamonds in the rough. So this is really great uh, what you have here. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's good to hear. And uh, I appreciate that too. Um, it's uh, like you said, we have a responsibility and, and uh, we can make an impact in the world with all, in all kinds of different ways. So yes, uh, yes we can. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us on this program tonight. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you enjoyed Dam, and uh, that you'll join us for other great uh, opportunities to hear from not just filmmakers, but uh, different artists, that, painters, everybody that is, is making art out there. So thank you again to Matthew, and we thank you for your time.